Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we've got a perfumers portfolio video and it's going to be a double header and it's going to be a big one because uh, today I want to talk about two of the most influential perfumers in the history of perfume period and they're both Guerlain's and I'm going to lump them together because uh, they're tied in the hip from my mind as far as uh, their stories go, the time frame, the perfumes that came out. I already did one of these on Jean-Paul Guerlain, probably my fa favorite uh, perfumer of all time. And you can go watch that video if you go click on the, um, if you go click on the playlist that I have under Perfumers Portfolio, you can find the one for Jean-Paul Guerlain. And, you know, I always feel like I can't do these videos justice because we're talking about titans here. We're talking about giants, colossuses, you know, people that set the trend for all of perfumery going forward. And the whole point of me doing these videos is that I want to give, um, you know, homage. I want to pay homage. I want to um, shine a spotlight on these men and women who, you know, for many of the you know, perfume years kind of worked behind the scenes. They were the unsung heroes and all that stuff. And now, obviously, everyone knows the name Amy Guerlain and Jacques Guerlain. Those are the two gentlemen we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to try to do this video justice. I mean, um, they've created some of my favorite fragrances of all time. I'm sitting here staring at just the, the couple that I have pulled from my collection. And, um, you know, these are some of the most influential perfumes in the history of modern perfumery. And so it's going to be very hard for me to express, um, you know, the level of um, attention to detail and love and, um, you know, the way that they change the course of, of the industry forever, basically. But I'm going to try my best. And the whole reason I'm doing this is because, you know, I love the art of perfumery and I just want to share it with other people out there that, you know, love the art of perfumery with me as well. So that's why I do these videos. So we're going to do scent of the day first because that is um, tradition at Channel Ramsey. And I'm going to do a fresh spray because I love this fragrance so much. And today's fragrance is a Guerlain. It's what inspired this video, actually. It's one of my favorite fragrances of all time. It actually made my top 10. I did a top 100 countdown. If you're new to my channel, uh, it's my most watched video on the channel, the top 100 countdown. It is hours long because I went through every single fragrance in a top 100 style, countdown style, and this made the top 10. This is Guerlain's Heritage Eau de Toilette. Uh, now, I prefer the Eau de Toilette over the Eau de Parfum, but the Eau de Parfum is, is still quite nice in my opinion. It's definitely full bottle worthy. In fact, if you had, I don't know, 40 bucks, 50 bucks, and you wanted to just get an amazing fragrance, the modern Eau de Parfum, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the modern Eau de Parfum. It's just the vintage Eau de Toilette with the gold cap uh, is an absolute masterpiece. I don't use that word lightly, uh, but to me, you know, when I smell this fragrance, I literally have like an emotional reaction. It's like, oh my God, when I smell it, I mean, it just, it, it, it fits my personality. It fits my aura. It, it fits my desire to, you know, wear a perfume that's intricate and I can break it down and changes. And I swear this thing has like four transitions in it. It is so in-depth and deep. The quality of the ingredients, the attention to detail, the way that you can smell old Guerlain fragrances in Heritage. Like, for example, when I first sprayed right now, I just got a whiff of Shalimar. Uh, if you know Jiki, that's a fragrance we'll be talking about soon, you will smell Jiki in here. Uh, you know, you will smell these previous Guerlains from the past. And um, the bottle is actually reminiscent of Facult's Pendulum. If you know the story of Facult's Pendulum, he created it in the 1800s to show the rotation of the earth and the whole idea with his pendulum is that the pendulum was not moving the earth is uh and you know just the the story how it all ties together the literally the heritage of the house of Guerlain is in this bottle to me and uh i i really love it i mean it's one of my favorite fragrances of all time i don't have a signature scent but if i did have one it, this would be a contender, you know, and, and Darby would be a contender from the same house. Um, 
Antaeus would be a contender, but I don't want to go down that list of signature scent contenders today. So um, if you if you know if you know this fragrance and um, uh, and you've had a chance to experience the vintage, leave your uh, comments in, down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But let's get started on talking about the two perfumers we're here to talk about. Uh, so the first one is Amy Guerlain, uh, and he basically had one big hit fragrance. Now he did other things, and I wish I could smell some of these other fragrances. It would be a dream come true. Uh, he did Queer de Russie, the original Queer de Russie, uh, which Jacques Guerlain then remade in the 30s. He did it in 1872. Um, and he did Imperial Russe, he did Eau de Cologne de Coke, and um, Eau de Vervain, and of course, the big one is Jiki. And basically, Amy Guerlain broke with convention, and he changed the course of fragrance history forever with his release, because he he is credited with Jiki, and I have both the Eau de Parfum here, okay? Uh, this is the modern version of the Eau de Parfum, if you will. I think this is a 2017 bottle, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, and I have a vintage Eau de Toilette right here. Uh, and it's not so old, you know, it's not like this is a 100-year-old bottle or anything. I think these bottles right here come from the 80s, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but the Eau de Toilette of Jiki, and the reason that he changed fragrance history forever is he basically merged synthetic uh, notes and natural materials into one composition for the first time. And um, he's credited with basically creating the fragrance that is known as the, you know, father of modern perfumery, if you will. This is uh, supposed to be a... Uh, Fougere fragrance, but let me talk a little bit about Amy Guerlain before we talk about Jiki. So he was the son of Pierre-Francois Pascal Guerlain, and he actually took over the house uh, at the age of 27. He was a very young man when he took over the house of Guerlain. His father apparently suffered from, you know, ailments, poor health, stuff like that. And so to focus on his work, which was supposed to be the perfumer of the House of Guerlain, uh, Amy turned over the management of the business to his brother, Gabriel. So Gabriel kind of ran the day-to-day -day management operations so that uh, Amy Guerlain could focus on learning to be the best perfumer that he could be. And um, in a stroke of fate, and maybe a little bit of genius from Amy Guerlain, um, he appointed Gabriel's 16-year-old son, Jacques Guerlain, uh, to become his apprentice in, in the perfume laboratory. Uh, and, you know, he basically set up this uh, continued dynasty in motion because at a very young age, Jacques Guerlain was learning the art of perfumery from Amy Guerlain. Uh, and so... Um, let's talk a little bit about Jiki because Jiki is kind of his, um, his great achievement. You know, imagine being the person that founded, uh, the modern perfumery with synthetics and naturals blended together for the very first time. Jiki is, uh, supposed to be a fougere, okay? And if you know the word fougere, it basically is meant to be um, fern-like. That's the word. That's what it basically translates to, fern-like. And what's interesting about Jiki is um, it came out in 1889. And legend has it that he created it in memory of a girl who he loved, uh, whose name was, uh, nickname was Jiki. But I think some people now are starting to question that narrative. And they're thinking that maybe he named it after his nephew instead. Um, and of course, it's one of the one of the modern, the very first modern fragrances. And what so amazes me about Jiki, and this is actually the version that I prefer. Okay, so I prefer the Eau de Toilette. Most Guerlains, um, I prefer the Eau de Toilette. And we'll talk about some of those as we go on. But there is one big one that I really prefer, the Eau de Parfum. Uh, or Parfum de Toilette version, um, but, you know, most of the time, it's the Eau de Toilette that, that 
the creations grab my attention the most for whatever reason. I think I think they just have more um, room to breathe. If you noticed on Heritage, I showed the Eau de Toilette. I prefer the Eau de Toilette over the Eau de Parfum. I don't even own a bottle of the Eau de Parfum. And it's the exact same for Abbey Rouge. I don't even own a bottle of the Eau de Parfum. It's the Eau de Toilette that I absolutely love the most. Um, and so Jiki was originally released, interestingly enough, as a man's fragrance. And it didn't do well. And so what they ended up doing is they switched it and began marketing it as a women's fragrance. And it caught like wildfire. Now, many men still wore Jiki. So when you hear the legend of Jiki, you'll hear people say, you know, this is a fragrance that was marketed for women. Uh, but men loved it so much they, they wore it. Well, there is some truth to that. Uh, men did continue to wear Jiki even after it got switched to marketing, um, to, to being marketed for women. Um, but I think a lot of that was because initially it was marketed towards men and it was kind of this commercial flop. And uh, it's, it's known as Sean Connery's signature scent, who just passed away recently uh, from James Bond 007 fame. And uh, I could totally see Sean Connery wearing this. It has this, um, this gentlemanly aspect to it. You know, imagine Sean Connery dressed to the nines, about to get knighted by the queen. Uh, that's what Jiki's uh, aura reminds me of. You know what I mean? Now, the thing about Jiki that tends to put people off is that Jiki has this vintage civet note. It has this, um, it has this uh, off-putting quality to it for modern, for someone that's only smelled modern releases. If you've only smelled stuff like Sauvage, Eros, um, you know, that kind of stuff, Blue de Chanel, Jiki will be a shock to your system because it has this old school lavender to it uh, and it has this uh, vintage civet, which I actually sent a decant of the Eau de Parfum to Russian Adam whenever I made him a sample set of some vintage fragrances that he wanted to smell. And um, he said that the dry down of this smells uh, just basically like civet in the dry down. And I know exactly what he means, and that's the modern. Uh, the vintage, I feel like, has more layers, more more aspects to it. It doesn't um, transition to the base and just smell of civet. There's a bigger ride to get there. And this is an older bottle. So the, um, the amazing thing about this is you get this, uh, what's the word, uh, hesperitic green, you know, um, there's like this basily lavender uh, gentlemanliness to it, but it's contrasted with a touch of leather in the base, and it's contrasted with that animalic civet, which, you know, adds this almost like human warmth, you know, almost like a human, almost like a human skin, or some people have used the term halitosis when you smell that, um, Civet note, I don't think that's fair, but I understand what they're saying. Um, you know, if, 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 if that word offends you, basically, um, I think it's just one of the only ways that people have to describe that initial blast that they're not used to smelling, the, the animalic facet to it. I think it's a brilliant composition. And um, what's amazing is even in this original breakdown, okay? You get this vanilla, this Guerlainade type feel, and they only um, admitted that the Guerlainade was even a thing in Heritage. Heritage was a first for the house on many fronts. It was the first fragrance that they released the concentration for men in Eau de Parfum and Eau de Toilette at the same time. Uh, they did, they never did that before, and it was the first time that Guerlain as a house admitted that yes, there is a Guerlainade accord, if you will, uh, that's in their fragrances, and you can even smell that in Jiki. Uh, but it is very vintage. It smells. Some people call this like a dandy perfume. Um, I don't think it's dandy. I know what they mean. They mean that it's a man in a well dressed suit. Um, you know. It, it, it has this um, this dandy vibe to it, I guess you could say, but I wouldn't call it dandy. 
to me, this is a uh, artifact of vintage perfumery. When I wear this, I feel like I'm wearing something, you know, found in like the pyramids or, you know, I feel like I'm wearing something that was uncovered in a in an ancient tomb or something. It really feels like I'm wearing something special, something part of history. But at the same time, what so amazes me about Jiki is the fact that it's so wearable to me. You know, some people, when I first got Jiki um, in either formula, I remember people saying, do not wear that during summer. Do not wear that if the temperature is over 60 degrees Fahrenheit, this, that, or whatever. The civet note is off-putting. You'll put people off. And at first I listened to them. And then I started to kind of trust my nose more and more. And I realized that there's all these other aspects to Jiki. There's this um, slight patchouli, slight beautiful powdery or orris. There's some spices. There's some um, vetiver in here. But the star of the show by far is that herbal, um, lavender, and civet. Uh, and those are the two kind of stars of the show. There's other aspects. There's a rosewood note listed. There's also a floral rose listed. Uh, there's rosemary, which rosemary traditionally has been a very masculine note. If you think about things like Paco Rabanne Por Homme, they used a big slug of rosemary in there. And so you get this rosemary, lavender... Uh, and of course, if you're going to have a fougere, you have to have a base of tonka. And there is tonka in here, but it's nothing like the modern tonka. If you've only smelled stuff like uh, tonka imperial or feb delicious or some of the modern tonka fragrances like Guerlain's Lome Ideal that Thierry Vasser created, the tonka in here is completely different. It's actually more like the real tonka bean absolute that I've smelled. So... Um, that's kind of the breakdown of the fragrance, that lavender, uh, that hesperitic greenness, um, that vanilla base, and of course the civet that I love so much. Uh, this is an amazing fougere, and um, it's basically Amy Guerlain's claim to fame. I mean, he, he stamped his name in the, uh, in, in the fragrance hall of fame with Jiki. And it will always be talked about as kind of the modern, the first modern fragrance, if you will, in 1889. Uh, and that's pretty much the only hit that he had. Uh, he, like I said, he created other things, but none of them grew to the, um, none of them grew to the fame that, uh, that Jiki, uh, that Jiki had. And so if you've never had a chance to smell Jiki, I would highly encourage you to check it out. It was a very brave, very bold, you know, very, um, um, you know, it was a fragrance that kind of captured the imagination, if you will. And so the, the fragrance that many people compare it to, which we'll get to next, is Mouchoir de Monsieur. Now, Mouchoir de Monsieur was actually created by Jacques Guerlain. And Jacques Guerlain has probably... Um, my favorite quote in all of in all of fragrance quote history. We'll talk about it in a second. But he was born in 1874, and um, he was the third Guerlain perfumer, and probably the most famous to be uh, to be honest with you. I think um, because Jean Paul Guerlain created so many fragrances that just resonate with me personally. He created Vetiver, Abbey Rouge. Uh, heritage, all that good stuff, and even the patchouli and heritage will remind you of the patchouli that you're going to smell in Lidge, which he did not create, uh, but he was still part of the Guerlain house when it did get released and created. Um, I think that's why I say he's my favorite, but without a doubt, the person that has the most uh, classic hits, if you will, is Jacques Guerlain. And uh, like I said, his, his uncle, Amy Guerlain, taught Jax from the age of uh, 16. And, um, you know, this fragrance, uh, Mouchoir de Monsieur, is definitely, you can, you can definitely see the link between Jiki. So the story behind Mouchoir de Monsieur is that Guerlain noticed that a lot of men were wearing Jiki. And one of uh, Jax's best friends was about to get married. And so they created this fragrance 
uh, just for him because he liked Jiki, but he wanted kind of a masculine take on Jiki. And the name Mouchoir de Monsieur um, roughly translates to gentleman's handkerchief. And the reason it translates to gentleman's handkerchief is in the old days, uh, back when people still had some class and norms, they would go out uh, and they would go to the club or whatever they called it back then, speakeasy, bar, whatever it was, um, and they would have a handkerchief in their suit because, of course, the men dressed up in suits. You wouldn't go out in a t-shirt back in the day. They had class, like I said. And so the tradition was if you met a girl at the place that you liked uh, and, you know, you had a great evening together and you wanted to give her a memorabilia to remember you by, you would take your handkerchief out and you would literally uh, put some of Mouchoir de Monsieur on the handkerchief and give it to the, to the woman that you were courting, if you will. Uh, and so that's the story behind Mouchoir de Monsieur. Now, the quote that I want to talk about comes when we're talking about L'Air Bleu, which comes a few years later. This is 1904. We still have Opre Lande, which I'm going to talk about, but L'Air Bleu, L'Air Bleu came next. And the quote that I want to leave you with, when you think about Jacques Guerlain, and I think the reason that um, he was so successful is he was such a artistic uh, genius. You know, some of the creations and some of the things he was able to do in the, you know, 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, it's just astounding. You know, there, there were no modern uh, chemical uh, lab, uh, companies like there are today. There was no Simrise. There was no Robert Tett. A lot of this stuff he created in a time where, you know, um, he it's not that he was flying solo, but he didn't have the, the team and the help that modern perfumers have. Uh, and when we talk about uh, Le Bleu, he had this quote, and it's probably my favorite quote in all of perfumery, like I said. He said um, he had a premonition of what would happen in Europe. This is before World War, World War I, okay? And he said that he... I, this is the quote, I could not put into words this emotion. I wanted to capture these last moments of beauty and calm before calamity and war. I felt something so intense that I could only express it in a perfume. Think about that for a second. I felt something so intense that I could only express it in a perfume. I mean... That is strong words um, and maybe one of the best lines that you could, um, you could have rattle around in your brain as to why we love the art of perfumery so much is literally there are things that a perfume can say that we don't have the vocabulary or the words to describe, you know what I mean? Um, so, Mouchoir de Monsieur, I think I prefer a little bit over Jiki. It's a toss-up, okay? For me, it's kind of a toss-up. I could go either or. When I crave one of these, I could wear either or and be content. Um, but I feel like Mouchoir de Monsieur, um, you know, it, it, it almost has that civet note even more amped up, if you will. Um... There is some powder in Mouchoir de Monsieur that um, I don't necessarily get in Jiki. And I think with Mouchoir de Monsieur, I think they added a couple notes. So number one, uh, there's no rosemary. So the rosemary from Jiki is removed. And they've added this lemon verbane, verbane lemon verbena-like note in the opening with the lavender and that uh, bergamot that, you know... Guerlain does bergamot openings like no other house. And bergamot is not a cheap note ingredient, by the way. Um, not the real bergamot they were using back in the day. Now a lot of it, I think, is synthetic. But uh, back in the day, when bergamot was an expensive ingredient. And uh, there's some narrowly. Uh, there's still the patchouli and rose and tonka, of course. This is still considered a fougere, I would say. Uh, and they've added this iris note to the vanilla. So I mentioned that the base of uh, Jiki has that Guerlainade vanilla uh, tonka amber combination that becomes famous from the house of Guerlain. 
And so with Mouchoir de Monsieur, uh, they added this powdery iris, which, which you would think almost makes it a little bit more feminine. But I think the trick is they offset that powdery iris with oak moss. And um, Jacques Guerlain uh, created a fragrance that will definitely remind you of Jiki, but uh, it's considered to be more masculine. And for the longest time, this was almost like um, uh, a boutique exclusive, if you will. Like there were no Mouchoir de Monsieur bottles that Guerlain sold. You had, to, you had to know, you know, you had to wink, wink, hey, fill me up a bottle of that Mouchoir de Monsieur that was hiding behind the counter kind of thing. Um, and that's how you basically bought this. If you weren't in the know, Guerlain didn't advertise Mouchoir de Monsieur for the longest time. And now, I don't know if it's discontinued, but I think it might be considered a Paris exclusive. So you can only get this in Paris now, which I think is just some of the decisions LVMH makes really kind of piss me off. Uh, but you know, this is Jacques Guerlain's first credited perfume in 1904. And do not be afraid of this. If you're, if you're a guy that wants to explore the Fougere world, I would recommend uh, Jiki. I would recommend Fougere Royale. Uh, I have an early impression of that coming very soon. And I would recommend uh, Mouchoir de Monsieur. If you want to smell the origins of the Fougere genre. Okay, and then a few years later, uh, 1900 six to be exact, he created Apre Londe. Now, this is a sample that was very kindly sent to me by Rachel. Uh, thank you very much. I plan on doing a early impression on this very soon because this is a fragrance that I need to have in my collection. It's kind of a, um, it's like a mark in time in fragrance history. It's this floral powdery fragrance that uses iris in one of the most beautiful ways. It almost feels like a wet iris, you know, like uh, Apre Londe um, gives me this rainy day impression of iris, if you will. And, um, you know, whenever they use iris, they don't use the flower, they use the bulb, the iris bulb normally. Uh, and iris or oris butter takes many years to sit. Um, you know, it's not just an ingredient that they dig up and it's ready to go. It has to be processed. It has to stay, it has to basically mature. I don't know what the word is, but it has to mature for many years before it becomes the beautiful ingredient that we know as iris. Uh, but imagine if they did use the flower, right? Which they don't. Um, I guess they, you, violet is, is the, the flower that would be listed if they were using the flower. I think they're kind of different smells, uh, but they both share similar chemical compounds, if you will. But imagine a, a violet wet from the rain that smells like that powdery iris floral that you're used to. And um, this musky base. Uh, with a lot of other florals. There's jasmine, orange blossom, or, or orchid. Uh, there is still that lavender-rosemary combo at the top, which, you know, he's still working with that lavender-rosemary from Jiki, even in, in 1909. Um, sorry, 1906. But this fragrance, uh, Le, uh, sorry, Apre Londe, was so revolutionary that even the great Ernst Bow um, considered it to be a major work in the perfume industry. Ernst Bow is no slouch. I mean, you know, he was one of the perfumers for the Tsar of Russia before uh, Chanel whisked him away to make her perfumes, if you will. Uh, and so Le Bleu is kind of his first true commercial success. Like I said, Mouchoir de Monsieur was kind of a behind the scenes, behind the counter, it wasn't, you know, a big hit, but Apre Londe was. It was his first big commercial success. And there is a beautiful heliotrope note listed um, in Apre Londe. Heliotrope, violet, iris, aldehydes, um, that kind of thing. And um, what's interesting about it is it's such a uh, important, it's such an important creation that uh, the great 
uh, Jean-Claude Elena created this in homage to it. Uh, this is L'Odiver by Frederick Mall, and I plan on doing an early impression on this too. Someone sent me a, a sample of this, and you know who you are, thank you very much. One of my perfume god persons that uh, have been so kind to me. The generosity of the community, honestly, has uh, really been humbling. It's been... Um, it's taking me back. That's one of the things I was not expecting when I started this channel is uh, for people to be as generous as they have been. And so L'Odiver was is an homage to Apre Londe. And as much as I wanted to wear this and talk about it, I couldn't until I really got to do an early impression of, of Apre Londe first. Because how could I talk about the fragrance that, you know, was inspired by Apre Londe if I haven't done a video on Apre Londe yet? Uh, and so I'll tell you, this is definitely full bottle worthy for me, but, um, video on that coming soon. And what's interesting is, you know, I was thinking about that Hawthorne, in Apre Londe, there's this Hawthorne, uh, note in the opening with the rosemary and the lavender and the bergamot. And Jean-Claude Elena made a fragrance, uh, for his Hermesence line called Queer d'Ange. And Queer d'Ange has this beautiful Hawthorne, um note that mixes with the leather that gives it almost this white leather vibe um this creamy white leather it's not my favorite type of leather but this fragrance is really growing on me if i uh re-ranked my top 100 this would be very close to maybe breaking in it just missed out when i did it last time but you know it's an ever-changing list um Oh, God, Heritage is so beautiful. But anyways, I just thought I'd mention that since he did Lodiver as a um, homage to Apre Londe, and then I, I noticed the Hawthorne note in Quirt Ange, and it just reminded me of, you know, obviously Jean-Claude Elena is a big fan of, the, of um, fragrances from the past. So, uh, next, we're going to go to 1912. Um, in 1912, he released... Le Bleu. And Le Bleu is, in my opinion, the greatest uh, heliotrope fragrance I've ever smelled. This floral, powdery heliotrope. Again, he was playing with the heliotrope note with Apre Londe, but I think he almost perfected it with Le Bleu. Apre Londe, I think, is more about the iris. Le Bleu is more about the heliotrope. Uh, there's still that iris violet accord if you will. Uh, there's a beautiful carnation note in here. There's that Guerlainade Vanilla Benzoin Tonka. This is the fragrance that he said uh, he felt something so strongly that um, he couldn't put it into words. He could only express it in a perfume. And Apre Londe does give me this, um, you know, this very introspective, sad, almost sad, you know, uh, the the blue hour, if you will. The Lair Blue was supposed to be uh, the moment right before the sun set and daytime turned to nighttime where you have that uh, crazy time where there's still light in the day. There's still a little bit of light out, but the sun is technically below the horizon. That is uh, what inspired Lair Blue. And so this is kind of like this um, semi-oriental heliotrope, vanilla, uh, iris and violet, and I get a big purple color, like in my brain. When I wear Le Bleu, um, it's, it's one of the, you know, sometimes people will say, do you smell a color? What color do you smell when you smell a perfume? And this is um, one of the best examples of that because I get a strong, you know, violet, uh, purple color when I, when I smell Le Bleu. Very strong. I mean, one of the strongest color associations with any fragrance. And, of course, it came right before World War I, uh, which was a huge tragedy as far as loss of human life and suffering and all that stuff. And, um, you know, Jacques Guerlain being in Paris and, of course, what the French went through, uh, what both sides went through, of course. But um, the French were right there in the middle of it all. And, um, you know, this perfume was almost like foreshadowing that tragedy. Uh, and what a... I mean... When, when we talk about art in a bottle, um, I think this is where he really broke out. You know, yes, Apre Londe is amazing. Mouchoir de Monsieur is amazing. But this, 
this is like, you know, you're, you're listening to an, an artist uh, just continue to perfect his craft. And then this is like his breakout hit is the way that I view his career. Uh, and I even have the modern Eau de Parfum. And it is absolutely stunning. I mean, both of them. I think I prefer the vintage Eau de Toilette. Um, but I'll tell you what, if you don't mind it being a little bit heavier, um, a little bit weightier, uh, a little bit more vanilla and tonka and that kind of stuff, there's nothing wrong with the modern Eau de Parfum at all. This is just a little refill I got for a great price. But, um, you know, the, I think this is a 2017 bottle too. I'm not sure. But, uh, this is... SH2AR is the batch code. I'm not sure the year, but I think it's from the 80s. And um, I mean, the vintage Eau de Toilette is just, this is one of those fragrances where when I put it on, I just almost go into my own world. You know, I just want to look out the window and um, it's just so introspective. There's a few fragrances in my collection that do that to me, but uh, Le Bleu is just so introspective to me. Okay, next is Mitsuko, my favorite Shifra of all time. Uh, although, uh, you know, Diaghilev gives it a run for its money in terms of my favorites to wear. Um, but Mitsuko is the only one that actually have all three versions. So I have the, um, I have the Eau de Toilette right here, which is my favorite version. I have the Eau de Parfum, which is amazing in and of itself. I don't know how old this bottle is. This is, I think, 2014, and this is still amazing. Um, I mean, the depth of this fragrance as a modern Eau de Parfum. I haven't smelled the new stuff, but this from eight years ago, stunning. And um, I even have the vintage Eau de Cologne. So I haven't shown this off before, I don't think, or if I have, it's been maybe a one-time thing. You can see the copyright... Guerlain, 1967. So this is what the old Guerlain boxes look like. They called these uh, bottles the clock face, the clock face bottle. I'll show you here. Let me get it out. Here's the clock face bottle. Um, be absolutely beautiful presentation. Um, and I mean, I got this for peanuts. I think I paid 50 bucks for this, 60 bucks maybe. And I consider that a steal. Um, oh, and even though it's an eau de cologne, yes, it's a little bit lighter, but this is so deep. I mean, how do you create a fragrance that's light, but also has such depth? That is the eau de, eau de cologne of, um, of, Ger of Guerlain's Mitsuko. And... Um, you know, again, my favorite version is the Eau de Toilette, uh, but this came out in 1919, I believe. Yes, 1919. Uh, and so, obviously, the uh, most important Chifra fragrance for fragrance historians is Coty's Chifra, uh, which I've never smelled. I would love to smell that one day. Uh, and this, to me, though, is the one that kind of took that formula and kind of ran with it. Now, I've never smelled the, the Shifra, so I can't say perfected it, but as far as availability goes and just something you can go buy, uh, I don't think you will be able to find a fragrance that has the complexity of Mitsuko because Shifras are very complex fragrances, right? Uh, this has this beautiful bergamot opening mixed with this peach, lilac, and ylang-ylang ambergris, oak moss, vetiver, spices, cinnamon. It's just, it's one of the best uh, experiences you can ever find for a Shifra fragrance. And there's a story behind Mitsuko too. I can't remember all the details, so I don't want to tell it now and mess it up. Um, but it, it, it happens to do with the attraction uh, of Jacques Guerlain to Asia, and particularly Japan. Uh, and it's supposed to be like an archetype for the post, you know, war modern woman, if you will. This emancipated woman. This, uh, um, if you contrast it with kind of the pre-war perfume of Le Bleu, these are completely different. And um, they're both absolutely stunning as far as uh, 
as far as compositions go. And people will argue what is the, you know, what is the best perfume by, by Jacques Guerlain. Um, that's a very tough question to answer because I think it just has to do more with personal taste. They're all, um, you know, almost all of these are masterpieces. And again, I don't use that word lightly, but um, when you talk about these type, this level of perfumery, absolutely. And then what, what many considered to be his masterpiece, his magnum opus, if you will, is uh, Shalimar. And so this is a vintage Parfum de Toilette. Sorry, the bottom's dirty, but uh, you can kind of see there it says Parfum de Toilette. And um, this is a modern Eau de Parfum, or modern-ish. I think this is a 2016 bottle, but I'm not sure. Uh, and, or 2006 or 2016, I'm not sure which one. Uh, 6Y01 is the batch code on this one. And um, so Shalimar made my top 10. When I did my top 100 countdown, Shalimar made my top 10. And the reason that it did is when I think of vanilla in a perfume, I just, I don't want to wear anything else. I mean, every time I wear Shalimar, it makes me feel, it makes me feel a certain way, you know. Uh, like I'm wearing the absolute perfect vanilla scent. The story behind it with the Taj Mahal and, you know, the, 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 uh, the death of, I can't think of her name, unfortunately, I don't have the info in front of me, but uh, the, the, the death of um, the woman who uh, he made the Taj Mahal for, which you guys could probably look it up and put it in the comments, uh, and his grief and sorrow uh, over her death. She died in childbirth to make it even worse. And there's a lot of fountains, you know, the, um, if you look at the Shalimar bottle, the actual bottle, you'll notice that the blue cap almost looks like either a fountain gushing or almost like the royal headdress that the women used to wear back in the day. There's just so much little beautiful details on Shalimar. It's my favorite oriental fragrance of all time, I think. Uh, the vanilla, the iris, the jasmine. Uh, the, that orris, that orris butter note, uh, mixed with the bergamot in the top, and then whatever is in the base, the castorium, I don't know what it is, civet, castorium, um, yes, it's powdery, yes, it's oriental, yes, there are some floral touches, but, um, so here, I'll just read you something. It says, the Persian word Shalimar means the purest of all human pleasures. It is the name of an Indian garden which was extended by the Mughal emperor Shah Jahan for his beloved main wife, Mumtaz Mahal. There you go. After her death, uh, he erected the famous Taj Mahal mausoleum, which today symbolizes the dazzling grandeur of the Orient. Thus, the name Shalimar invokes love, beauty, and perception of the Orient, and hence oriental fragrances. Um, Shalimar is regarded as an iconic oriental fragrance. According to the often told, but not very reliable legend, Jacques Guerlain accidentally added too much vanillin when blending a batch of Jiki. It smelled unexpectedly good. Uh, and so there you have it. The modern Eau de Parfum came out in 1986, but the vintage original version of Shalimar came out in, uh, 1925. So again, we're talking six years after Mitsuko, uh, he came out with Shalimar. Uh, in my top 10, definitely my favorite vanilla. If you are a man who has never smelled Shalimar and you love perfume like I do, please go get yourself a bottle of Shalimar. Even if you go to TJ Maxx and just find a little refill Eau de Parfum, trust me, it is one of the most beautiful compositions um, I think you'll ever smell. I mean, it's, it's perfumery at its highest level. There is, um, there's very little that you can buy today, even if you go spend thousands, okay? You can spend thousands on niche fragrances and you won't be able to compete with a uh, $40 bottle of Shalimar EDP. It's just stunning. And if you want to take the next step, get the vintage Eat Parfum de Toilette. The vintage Parfum de Toilette is my favorite version. It's a little bit more dirty. Uh, it's dirty vanilla, you know, that dirty vanilla and um, bergamot and 
iris and it's just i mean um it's just discovering shalimar was almost like a next step in the journey for me because when i discovered this i mean my eyes just went as as wide as my head like what what am i missing out on from the past because of the uh biases that you know are basically ingrained in us like you don't wear women's perfume well, once I broke that barrier down, Shalimar was uh, was one of the fragrances that really broke that down. Shalimar and Mitsuko were really the ones that broke that barrier down for me. And once it was broken down, I mean, there were a ton of fragrances for me to discover. And um, that's why I, I think Shalimar is uh, a masterpiece. And, um, you know, obviously it's not for everyone, but... Uh, I've got a vintage bottle of Shalimar on the way soon. I'll tell you about it whenever it actually arrives. But uh, Jacques Guerlain, um, Shalimar, it was, um, he was, let's see, he was 50 years old um, when, when he created Shalimar, which became basically like reference oriental. You know, you want a reference oriental? There you go. Uh, and it, it, um, there was a saying back in the day, uh, let me see if I can think about it, proper women uh, don't drink, they don't smoke, and they don't wear Shalimar or something. It was something to that effect. They don't curse, they don't smoke, they don't uh, wear Shalimar. You guys could probably look it up, but uh, that was the saying from back in the day because Shalimar had this dirty sexual aspect to it. Shalimar... Um, feels like two bodies making love you know that's what the dirty vanilla and all you know the cast if there is castorium in the base or civet it's not listed but it feels like there's maybe a little bit of that uh and you know it has that feeling that warmth almost like you're envisioning um the i can i can never remember the names i'm sorry almost like you're envisioning uh, Mumtaz Mahal and um, the Emperor Shah Jahan making love in the gardens in Shalimar. It has that, you know, it has that warmth of two bodies combining. And it's just an amazing composition. Absolutely stunning. Uh, and then I'm going to show you a decant, which I did an early impression on. This is a very hard fragrance to find. Uh, it is, you know, watch my first impression, my early impression, if you haven't seen it. Uh, this is called Jeddi, and Jeddi is, um, it's beyond a unicorn. I mean, it's like a unicorn of unicorns. Uh, would I love a bottle of Jeddi? Absolutely. Would I pay 10 or 20 grand for it? Hell no. Uh, but I, I mean, Jeddi would be, would it be a dream come true to own a bottle of that? Yes. Uh, 1926 it came out. It's this leathery, animalic, vetiver fragrance okay i consider jeddi to be a vetiver perfume at heart um and there are uh there's a story behind it go watch the early impression video but there's this aldehydic floral there's that guerlain bergamot but there's something very unsettling about it you know almost like you're smelling uh, a mummy someone that came back from the dead and that's part of the story as well there's this animalic, mossy, uh, dirty, dry. It's it's one of the most dry fragrances I've ever smelled. Like completely devoid of water, dry. Um, but it's but you know again, modern noses will be put off by Jeddi. If you ever get the chance to smell Jeddi and you've never smelled anything like this, you're going to be taken aback. You're going to be shocked. Um, it's not going to, uh, sit well with the Blue de Chanel wearers, but if you love perfume, uh, this sort of leathery, it must be castorium. I don't know what they're using to create that animalicness, um, but that rooty, earthy, you know, vetiver, almost like you're underground, the roots are growing around you and then you sit up and say, sorry, I'm not really dead. You guys buried me alive. That kind of vibe is in Jeddi. Um, go watch my early re review or impression on this. I should probably wear this so it doesn't just evaporate on me. Um, but uh, yes, I should wear my decants more. But Jeddi is a, I mean, 
it's 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 a dream come true to smell and Jacques Guerlain did that in 1926 a year after Shalimar um and it was based on this the story without going too deep into it is it was based on an ancient Egyptian magician who was uh, reportedly able to bring back the dead to life. And uh, it sold up until the 1950s. Uh, it was never part of their main range. And um, in 1996, they released a 60 ml original copy uh, for its 60, I think for its 70th year anniversary. Uh, and you, I think that's probably the bottle that this came from. But... Um, I mean, just a just a just a unicorn of unicorns, if you will. If you've ever smelled Jeddi, let me know what you think. Uh, Sultan Pasha said it was the fragrance that um, inspired him to create many of his fragrances. Like when he smelled it at the Osmotech, it uh, it 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 gave him um, you know like it really moved him almost to tears. Like he had to go in the corner. And Russian Adam said that he ordered a sample of Jeddi, and while he was waiting for it to arrive, he created War and Peace, uh, you know, imagining what Jeddi would smell like without ever smelling it. This, this was his creation, War and Peace. Um, God, I love this stuff. Uh, so anyways, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a unicorn. It's a, um, you know, it's one of those that you just, as a frag head, you just have to smell it. You don't have to spend 20 grand on a bottle, but you just have to smell it, just so you know, just so you have that impression in your mind. Um, Jeddi is amazing. And then finally, 1933, we get Val de Nuit. This is the only bottle of Val de Nuit that I have. Um, it is green, woody, spicy there's this galbanum note that's added and again you talk about artistic Val de Nuit was based on a book called Night Flight or or something like that um and if you look at the x-ray bottle it looks like a propeller going around which in the 1930s um obviously that was people were enamored with flight and stuff like that and there's this beautiful narcissus note there's still that iris there's still that vanilla and orris type Guerlinade smell. Uh, there is oak moss in the base, so I think this is completely unisex, right down the middle. Men can wear it, women can wear it. Uh, that galbanum and, and oak moss, aldehydic, lemony, uh, bergamot, mandarin orange opening with orange blossom. I mean, it's just beautiful. It really does, um, every time I wear any of these creations, honestly, any of them. I know I talked about Heritage, how much I love it, but from Jiki all the way to Val, Val de Nuit, uh, these two perfumers, Amy Guerlain and Jacques Guerlain, they just capture my imagination every time. I mean, I could throw this on spring, summer, fall, and it just, you know, it just, it puts me in this state of mind that almost no other perfume can. And I think that's what makes it so special. That's what makes their creation so special is it's so wearable by just the average person. You know, anyone can wear Val de Nuit, anyone, and smell beautiful and go anywhere with it. Um, but someone like me that's an insane fragrance addict uh, can wear Val de Nuit and uh, try to get the breakdowns and, you know, catch the transitions and how it changes over time and the ingredients and try to pick out notes. And, you know, it, it satisfies both ends of the spectrum. Not an easy thing to do, and I have to give it to Guerlain. I know I give him a lot of, I give him a lot of uh, grief, and and admittedly so they deserve it because of the path that they've taken. Um, but I mean, thank God that they've kept these, uh, even though they're not in perfect form. I mean, with Ifra and cost cutting. I mean, the fact that LVMH owns the House of Guerlain, and they haven't just discontinued these you know, gems is a borderline miracle because LVMH is all about the money. They don't care about the history of fragrance. I mean, if they did, they would be releasing stuff like this. You want to compete with Roja Dove? Put Jeddi in a $650 bottle and sell it. Sell it. Who cares if only, 
a uh, thousand bottles sell worldwide. Who cares? You know, by doing that, you are proving to the world that you're serious about the fragrance. You're not just in it for the money. Instead, they're going to release the 17th Middle Eastern blend, um, you know, and it's, it's just, it's, for a house like Guerlain, you know, LVMH can, can uh, do whatever the hell they want with all the other houses, you know. They want to take Fendi down the hole. They want to do this or do that with the other houses that they own, fine. But Guerlain is like a sacred, hollowed house, you know. And I'm pretty sure that's the only reason they haven't discontinued some of these. I'm sure if it was up to LVMH, they would just chop. They would just chop. You know, Jiki, gone. Mouchoir de Monsieur, gone. They tried to get rid of Mouchoir de Monsieur. They basically did. Um, you know, if it were up to them, these would be chopped. And, and so, you know, I just wish, thank you for keeping it alive so people can at least smell some of these great classics. But on the other hand, I feel like they could go further. You know, they could do more. There's so much beautiful stuff out there. Imagine if Guerlain, like, recreated Metallica from the year 2000. Metallica makes me drool. I mean, uh, Jean-Paul Guerlain uh, created this uh, fragrance that uh, is, I mean, Metallica is probably the only fragrance that can compete with Shalimar as far as vanilla goes for my money, okay? Um, I know I've said I like stuff like Oduel and stuff like that, but that can't compete. I mean, that's just daily driver vanilla stuff. You talk about all-time great vanilla, Metallica is the only one that can compete with uh, Shalimar. And... And it's a Guerlain. It's a Guerlain of the next generation that created a vanilla fragrance that can compete with the previous Guerlain. And it's just discontinued. Just gone. Just, you know, they don't care. Uh, that should be, you know, if they need to double the price, uh, you know, it's selling on the secondary market for like 600, 800 bucks. If they need to put it out there for a grand, do it. Put it out there for a grand if that's what you think you need to do. But at least give us the option you know, and keep it in tip-top shape. If you're going to charge a grand, do what Roche is doing. Put it at the, put it at a grand and make sure you are using the absolute highest quality materials. No cuts, no cutting corners, uh, you know, don't skimp anywhere. And you will see the true frag head start to come back to the house of Guerlain. They yearn for that. But LVMH isn't giving it to us. Instead, we're getting the 19th flanker of the Middle Eastern series, which I'm so sick and tired of. Uh, we're going to get another version of Low Midial. We're going to get, you know, it's just, it's, it's really frustrating to see the house go down. And then, to make matters worse, they take these fragrances, like, they take something like Tonka and Pidial, which I've come to the conclusion that this is probably the best Tonka um, the true Tonka fragrance, right? Just a, uh, a fragrance that's going to give you all aspects of the Tonka bean. And they, they change the bottle and they double the price or triple the price. It's just, it's infuriating. You know what I mean? That, um, there's no need for that. There's no need to put Tonka Imperial in a new bottle and double or triple the price. It's just, uh, it's it's disappointing, is what it is. I'm very disappointed in the house of Guerlain because they're my favorite house, and because I care about them so much. You know, as a perfume lover, they have some of the most important fragrances in my arsenal. And um, you know, uh, as much as I love the perfume past, as I've talked about, Amy Guerlain and Jacques Guerlain deserve all the credit and then some. Guerlain should be celebrating these people. I mean, they almost let uh, 70, 80, 90, 100 year anniversaries go by with nothing happening. They don't even, they don't even celebrate it. What do they do? Put an Instagram post up? It should be a big deal to the house of Guerlain. But LVMH, um, I don't think they know how. I don't think they know how to use this asset they have because... It doesn't fall into the usual um, standard operating procedure of LVMH. LVMH has this standard operating procedure, okay? And they want this, 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 and this, and they try to apply it to every house. Guerlain doesn't work that way. 
you have to take a different approach to a house of Guerlain. The people that love Shalimar, Lair Bleu, Mouchoir de Monsieur, Val de Nui, Mitsuko, Jiki, they're different people, um, you know, from the house of Kenzo. You can't apply the same logic from Kenzo to Guerlain. You know, you have to um, tweak it. You have to do things differently for the house of Guerlain. Guerlain is special. Uh, and they're wondering why it's not working. They're wondering why sales are down. It's because I would, I would not buy some of the new stuff they're putting out. It's not for me. You know, I don't care if it is $80 or $100 or $150. Again, I would pay triple, quadruple. Give us Roja prices, but give us the quality that we came to know and love with Guerlain. If that's what you have to do, extend the line. You know, keep some cheap stuff. For the masses because that's what sells nowadays i understand they need the designer type releases but for the you know real frag head uh i i feel like they've lost them they they they've gone down a path that real frag heads can't follow that release of abby rouge uh Le instinct or whatever what the hell was that i mean you know, Wafts from the Loft just absolutely bashed that fragrance because, and they said the same thing, it's because we love the House of Guerlain. Uh, we wouldn't do this otherwise. It, it feels like a father trying to spank a kid, you know what I mean? Like trying to get them to come around, like this hurts me worse than it hurts you thing, but you got to learn, kid. Uh, and, and, and LVMH, uh, I, they just don't, they don't know what to do with the House of Guerlain. They have this amazing asset, this jewel, I mean, one of the most important fragrance companies in the history of fragrance, and they don't know what to do with it. Um, but this this fragrance video is not about that rant. That's a completely different topic. This is about honoring uh, Jacques Guerlain and Amy Guerlain for their creations. Um, someone told me that some bigger channels are starting to do perfumers portfolio videos, and if I had any influence on that, I am thrilled. I am uh, happy as punch that that is happening because I think the perfumers behind the scenes deserve the limelight, the spotlight, all that good stuff. So anyways, uh, likes, subscriptions, comments always help. But, you know, I'm just grateful to anyone that does leave a like, a subscription, a comment. Um, you know, literally, I mean, I read every comment. I try to respond to every single comment. And uh, let me know your thoughts on the topic of Guerlain. Let me know your thoughts on some of these beautiful gems. And uh, I hope to see you again tomorrow with another video. Bye, guys.